Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. We'll be in chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 45 and go through 52. If you would like to follow along in the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 1001. If you are new or visiting with us and you don't own a Bible, that Pew Bible is our gift to you. We want you to have it. We don't want you to leave here without the Word of God in your hand. We believe in its importance. We stand on the power of His Word. So again, our scripture today is Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 45. And it's written. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. If you would, please join me in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this week, I I spent some time on the telephone with one of our elders, a very dear friend of mine, and and we were having a chat, and, and, uh, you know, there's moments and times when someone asks you how you're doing, and you know that it is more of a, a niceness of just the moment, and then there's a time when someone asks you, how are you really doing, and and they, they, they're ready, and, and they're there to hear how you're really doing. And so I was asked that this week. How are you really doing? And, and I'm thankful for all of our elders and, and for this elder in particular to, to ask me this in this moment. And, and, I, and I said, well, you know, there, there's a peace, right? There, there's some peace that comes. And, and, and he knows what I'm talking about, but he said he asked questions and pressed me on. And I say, well, when we look at Jesus, when we look at everything he has to offer, when he talks about us, he, he offers us incredible things. He offers us salvation. He offers us life abundant, things we can't do on our own. But while we're here yet still in this world, he offers us one thing that nothing in this world can give us. And it's peace. And he says this in John 14 in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And we just talked about this peace that, that is so comforting that Jesus gives us, that gives us the ability that we can walk in a room unafraid because we ultimately know whose we are. And by knowing whose we are, we then have an identity for who we are, who I am. And it's that we are deeply loved and cared for by God. And so as we're having this discussion, we're, we're talking about uh, mountaintops and valleys. And he, he relayed to me something he was taught a long time ago in, in which he said, you know, I was once taught to take notice that fruit trees... Never grow at the top of mountains. You're more likely to find the fruit trees down in the valley by the stream of water. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just sit with that, right? We, we, when we sit with it for a moment, we, we begin to understand it. But, 
when we're in one of those valleys, we're in one of our storms, you know, in that time of sorrow, in the time of grief, the time of suffering, a time of pain or, or misery, we, we're not really looking around for fruit trees. We're more looking for a rescue rope on a helicopter to pull us the heck out of there and take us to the mountaintop right away. Never mind walking through the valley until we can find a path to climb up. And you know, he's right. Fruit trees do grow in the valley. It's in, the, it's in our valleys that Christ is with us and that he is growing us in very unexpected ways, right? It's in those times of the valleys that we begin to realize exactly who we are and who our faith is in. Now, there's an Old Testament scholar named um, George Adam Smith, and he once climbed the Weisshorn in Switzerland, and he went with a guide on a stormy day. And, and this is one of the mountains you can climb in the Swiss Alps, and he's there, and he made it to the summit. And they, they went up the sheltered side, so the storm wasn't really getting there. And when they get to the peak, Smith is so excited and exhilarated with the triumph of making it to the top, with the expectation for the views that will be from the height of the mountaintop, that he springs up. Forgetting about the stormy wind that's there and it almost pushes him over the edge until his guide grabs him. His guide grabs him and pulls him down and he says, on your knees. You're only safe here on your knees. Mm. Valleys and mountains. One seemingly lasts forever, and the other one seems that it never lasts long enough. Both inform us of who we are and where our faith is in, yet we strive for the highest of highs and desperately wish we could get back to them as soon as we leave them. But you know what? right after the mountaintop experience the disciples had. And when we look at the text, right before they go on this Sea of Galilee trip where they encounter yet another storm, they just had the mountaintop experience of all experiences in Jesus' ministry. A crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children gathered around to hear Jesus teach. And then not only hear Jesus teach, they only had five loaves of bread and two fish uncertain of how any of this was going to work. And Jesus performs a miracle of all miracles that everyone talks about. And as soon as it's over, it says immediately he put the disciples on the boat. He made them leave that height of a ministry mountaintop experience in which there were thousands of people clamoring to get closer to Jesus, bringing their mattresses, wanting to touch his tassels, just wanting to get near him for his healing and his miraculous works. And Jesus says, y'all need to go now. And he says it to the crowd as well. He dismisses them to go back to their homes. And like that, that mountaintop of a ministry experience is over and he sends them out on the boat. And he goes on top of the mountain to pray. And as they're out there on the Sea of Galilee, and anytime the disciples get in the boat, we're wary of what's going to happen. This time's no different. And nor'easter blows through the stormy wind, as we are known to experience ourselves here on the beach, that can really blow things and becomes blustering. The seas become tormented and tossed. And the disciples are out there rowing their oars, painfully trying to make headway, getting nowhere fast. They're rowing and rowing. We can imagine the picture, can't we? We can imagine almost that they're in this little dinky of a boat and there's 12 of them all with oars except for Peter. He's holding his up like a staff with his beard flowing backwards and the raindrops coming down, commanding them to go faster, deeper, stronger. And the disciples looking up at him like, we are, it's not working. And Jesus Calmly up on the mountain praying. If we stop in this moment right here in this scripture. And we paint that picture within our mind's eye. 
Or we recall a picture, a painting from the Renaissance or earlier of this exact moment. We see that at this moment, this picture portrays a deep spiritual truth of our present reality. Jesus praying atop the mountain and us struggling against the wind. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, Paul writes, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And so as we picture ourselves in that boat in the storm-tossed seas, struggling to get ashore, making headway nowhere fast, and Jesus on top of the mountain praying, right now is that ultimate reality. We are going through stuff in our lives. We are in the valley of it, and yet Jesus is in the highest of ultimate heights of heaven, and there, sitting at the right hand at the throne of God, our Lord is Praying to him on your behalf. And if you want to know more specifically what he's praying, go read John chapter 17. He's praying for you. He's praying for your endurance, your perseverance, for your faith, for God to be mindful of you and to watch over you and protect you. The Lord is praying for you. This is our present reality, but it's more than that. For we see down there in in that boat, the tiny church of the 12 apostles struggling. And it picks up in verse 47. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. A place we've all been painfully trying to get our boat ashore against the wind and the Lord called his disciples into this water. He, he made them get on this boat and in their faithful obedience, they run into struggles and suffering. Hear that again. The Lord made them get on the boat to cross the sea. And with that faithfully following Christ, they still encountered suffering and struggles. They were not immune from it. But there they found themselves struggling. Jesus had led them into that moment of the feeding the 5,000. And he took them from success and brought them right into another storm. They're struggling painfully, it says, to make headway. And I'm sure they wondered... Much like we wonder when we're in the midst of a deep struggle and suffering and pain and misery, we wonder, does he even care? Does he even care about me? Yeah, we know he's the God and creator of the universe and he generally cares about everything, but does he care about me? This is a fundamental existential question we have within the depths of our being because as much as we want to be about other people, we are significantly about ourselves. And the Lord of all creations, the great God of the universe, who's over everything and everyone, does he care about me? We wonder as we struggle and we suffer. It's cloudy, it's dark, it's rainy, we can't see straight, we're tossed to and fro. Does he care about me? Because right now, if we're honest, when we're in the midst of those moments, in the midst of those valleys, in the midst of those storms, deep within that suffering and the pain and the sorrow, in our anxiety, we, we wonder, does he even care? Does he see me struggling? Does he notice what's going on? And so oftentimes we begin to imagine that God is blind to us. He can't even see us. But this scripture here teaches the exact opposite. That followers of Christ 
When you are in the valley, when you are in the storms, you are a special object of compassionate care of his. It tells us that he sees you from the land. He was watching the disciples. He not only sees you, he cares for you because this is what happens. And then in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And he meant to pass by them. came to be with them, to pass by them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. These are the words of David. King David, a man after God's own heart, he understood that in the valleys and the storms of life, he was not alone, but God was with him. And here the disciples are struggling in the storm to get ashore three and a half miles from where they need to be, using all of their effort to get nowhere fast, wondering, does he even care? And he shows up to be with them. But it says he meant to pass by. Jesus was going to pass by, and it's because in the Old Testament, this is what God did to bring comfort and strength and encouragement to, to his chosen leaders, is that he called Moses in Exodus 33 and, 40, and 34 to go to the edge of the cliff on top of the mountain, stand on the stone, I'm going to cover your eyes, he says, and I'm going to pass by, and when I lift my hand, you'll turn and see the back of me, for no one could see and be revealed the face of God at that time without suffering from it. And he did so to let Moses know he was with him, to encourage him and strengthen him. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, he tells Elijah, go stand up on that mountain. I'm about to pass by. To bring comfort and peace and encouragement to Elijah for the ministry that he has ahead. Yet here, yet here, God doesn't send us to the mountaintop to let us know that he is with us. Here in the midst of the storm, struggling against the wind to get nowhere, Jesus meant to pass by so that they would know. That he's with them to bring peace and comfort and strength. Yet, like us, like we would have been, we imagine like if we were on the boat, would, would we have been scared of Jesus walking on the water? Yes. Yes, I've never seen anyone walk on the water. But to see Jesus walking on the water, it says the disciples were afraid and thought he was a ghost. All of them were terrified, the scripture tells us. Because the, the matter of the fact is they weren't expecting Jesus to show up. They weren't expecting him to show up in the manner that he showed up. And they weren't expecting him to aid them in the way that he aided them. They thought they were left there to toil and struggle on their own. Jesus was gone up on the mountain. So it is with us. We're no different. Often when Christ comes to us in our misery and our suffering, we reject him because we didn't really believe that he would even come to our aid to begin with. Other times we reject him because the help that he comes with comes in a way we didn't expect, nor in a way we really want, if we're going to be honest. Oftentimes, Jesus comes to help us in a way we don't want him to help us because, again, we want him to help us our way. He's not a magic genie, though. This isn't how it works. Yet Christ reassures us just as he reassured the disciples when they were afraid. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And then the scripture tells us this. He got in the boat with them. Jesus got in the boat with his disciples. They were afraid and terrified not only of his very presence, but terrified and worn out from the storm. And Jesus did not leave them to struggle alone. He got in the boat with them. And he gets in your boat too. 
Because our God is a living God, a resurrected Savior, not dead in the grave, but one who is alive and well with you. He did not leave you to go through that valley alone. Yes, it's dark. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Ooh, how can David say he'll fear no evil? How does he say that? Because he knows that God is with him. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Dear Christian. That peace that Jesus wants to give you, that nothing else in the world can give you, comes from hearing those words, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So remember, in the midst of those valleys, in the darkness of the storms, you don't go it alone. He cares for you. He sees you. And he climbs in the boat with you so that you will make it safely to his shore. Amen.